Hey everyone, good evening. Welcome very much for joining us tonight. B'zad Hashem to uh, our shiur on Mesilat Yisharim. Thank you very much. B'zad Hashem tonight we will be going through Perek Yutet and uh, Perek Yutet and part of Perek Yutet, which is pretty long. Uh, we'd like to dedicate tonight's learning, B'zad Hashem, for the complete and speedy recovery of Shach Ben Chana, Mordechai Ben Adina, Yaakov Yisrael Avra Ben Chana Esther Helen, Mordechai Ben Sarah, um, and uh, all of Cholei Yisrael, all those who need a refuah should have it, B'zav Hashem. Also, we would like to uh, learn the Elui Nishmat, um, Liel Dina Bat Ephraim, as well as Miriam Fega Bat Chaya, may their neshamot go higher and higher, and Gan Eden, B'zav Hashem. So, we're learning tonight, starting with Perek Yudchet of Mesilat Yisharim, and in this Perek, the Mesilat Yisharim is going to discuss the idea of Midat chasidut That's what this chapter is called, Bebi'ur Midat chasidut to understand, to explain the attribute of piety, to be a pious person. Now what that means is that a person goes beyond the letter of the law. Not, not that he only does what is required of him uh, in the best possible way, but he also searches for ways to do even more than what's required of him. Uh, this is the uh, next step as the Mesilat Yisraelim has taken us now Baruch Hashem, through uh, almost 18 chapters uh, that we've gone through. Uh, the Mesilat Yisraelim is going ahead and now taking us to the next level where we learn about what more can we do to come closer to Hashem, which as we discussed in the past really is ultimately the goal for why we're here to begin with. So he goes on to explain. He says that it's true that people uh, try to come closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu in all kinds of ways. People know that this is the ultimate goal, to, to become close with Hashem. But the problem is that a lot of times people go about it in the wrong way. They think that certain things are called acts of piety, but in reality, they're not necessarily what's appropriate for that particular person. What he should be doing is something different. And he goes on to talk about the famous things that people consider to be acts of piety. For example, uh, incredible amounts of fasting, incredible amounts of, uh, uh, of, of supplications in front of Hashem, uh, doing things that, that cause you to suffer pain, sigufim, um, you know, when you, when you roll in the snow and you do things like that. He says a lot of times people will cons would, would consider that to be the chasidut, the acts of piety that are required uh, in order for them to reach the next level. But says the Sefer Mesilat Yisharim, that's not really the, the right avenue. He says it's true that you might have some of these things uh, that are good for maybe repenting or for uh, very uh, holy people. But he says that's not really what chasidut, what piety is all about. It's different than that. Uh, sometimes people don't realize, but you know, you could, you could find yourself doing things that are really not for us, especially not for this generation. Uh, I'll give you one example. I once heard a story. This is going back many years, many years ago in Deal, New Jersey. We had a, a gentleman, again, very well-meaning, very, uh, you know, somebody who really wanted to do good. And uh, it was at this time of year in Deal, New Jersey. This gentleman had stayed in the shul later than everybody else. And he was, he was hanging around for a very specific reason. He wanted to make sure that, um, that nobody was going to be there. This was uh, a guy that apparently he felt that he needed to atone for certain things he had done in his past. So this gentleman is, is in shul. He waits till everybody leaves after Shabbat ends. And he sees the coast is clear. No one's around. Goes ahead and he goes to the exit, to the back exit of the shul. And he, he sees that it's a blizzard outside. It is absolutely freezing. It's snowing. And it's exactly the right moment for him to do it, what the Mesilat Hashem is describing, what he calls Tvilat Kerach V'Sheleg, when a person goes and dips in the ice and the snow without any clothes on in order to atone for his sins. So this guy decides that's, that's the ideal moment. No one's around. 
and he removes his clothing. He steps outside in the freezing blizzard and it's snowy everywhere and he rolls in the snow as much as he possibly can. He's backwards and forwards until the guy is absolutely frozen. He can't take it anymore. He really got his kapara. He really got his atonement. He has no doubt that it's now time to go inside because he did as much as he possibly could. And as he goes back to the door of the synagogue, he slowly realizes, oh no, maybe it locks. And surely enough, as he tries to open the handle, it's stuck. He can't open it. It's locked shut. And he's outside and he's in between a rock and a hard place, as they say, because now there's really nowhere to go. What are you going to do? Ask for help without any clothes on. It's kind of difficult. And he's uh, stuck on the outside. He needs his clothes. It's freezing. He has no choice. He has to do something. He's going to freeze to death, God forbid. Now he's really getting his kapara. So without any other choice, he simply takes his bare hands and smashes the glass of the, of the window of the door. And he opens up the door from the back. Of course, the alarm goes off. The sirens go off. And uh, that's how the story got up because the whole uh, 911 was alerted and everyone found out about what this guy was doing. But the point is that that is not something that the rabbis nowadays suggest anybody should be doing. Um, because what the rabbis today say is that it's not appropriate for somebody to run after things like that. But instead, that very same person could have probably even gained much more for himself had he decided to maybe double the amount of learning that he does on a daily basis or double the amount of tzedakah that he gives on a daily basis or on a monthly basis. He could have accomplished by far much more for himself. Uh, he definitely, definitely got a tremendous uh, kapara that he was looking for. But at the same time, it's not necessarily what is the best thing for him. So the Mesilat Shaim over here is specifically mentioning these types of things in order for us to understand that that is not really what people should consider to be chasidut, which means acts of piety. And um, the, uh, the, 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 the people that feel like this is the way to go, it's because they aren't really aware of what is the right thing to do. That is the way that Mesilat Yishayim explains it. So what is chasidut really? What does it mean to be pious? What it means to be pious in a nutshell, I'm just trying to paraphrase the words of the Mesla de Shalim. What it means to be pious is to love Hashem. When you love Hashem, when you love somebody, then you understand that, that when that person wants something, you don't need to be told five times you know, to go and do that. Even if they merely hint to something that they want, you will make every effort to go ahead and to fulfill the will of that person because of the fact that you love that person. It, you know, even if something can be, uh, it can be halachically acceptable, but if you are able to see, if you're able to sense, if you pick up on the idea that this is not necessarily what Hashem wants from you, then this is something that, um, that you will stay away from. That's the idea of, of, of being somebody who loves someone. When you love that person, then you know what the person, you're, you're not just trying to know exactly, take orders. You want, he wants A, B, C. No, it's I try to even find out under the surface, what is it that this person really desires? What is he really thinking? You know, sometimes, uh, you know, a person will ask for something and you can pick up on the fact that from what they asked, you can tell they really want more than that. But they're a little bit embarrassed. They're a little bit ashamed to ask for more than that. But you love them and you want to make them happy. So you're going to give them much, much more. Why? Because you can sense that there's more than what meets the eye. You can understand that there's more to it than what you're being asked to do. So therefore, we have an obligation as, as Jews to try and reach that next step. Not just to know what it is that Hashem said to do. Hashem said, light Shabbat candles. Hashem said, when you make a dough, separate challah and, you know, and do that mitzvah. Hashem said, go to the mikvah. Hashem said, X, Y, Z. Yes, true. Hashem said these things. But our job is to try and figure out on, a, on another level, okay, yes, this, this is what Hashem said. But what is it? What does Hashem really want? 
Hashem said those things. Those are the things that are clear. They're out in the open, no question. Those are the mitzvot, 100%. But beyond that, what does Hashem really want? I'll give you an example. Just an example that comes to mind. We've spoken about it in various classes in the, in the past, but it's important to bring out again. Think about this very special tzaddik. Her name was Kimchit. Kimchit was the woman that had the zchut to have seven children, seven boys of hers become Kohanim Gdoli. This is a story in the time of the Mishnah, that all seven sons at some point in their lives merited to serve as the Kohen Gadol, which means that you're the, the holiest man in the Jewish nation, the, the high priest of Am Yisrael. And the rabbis were amazed to see that there's a person like that, there's a mom in the Jewish nation that had seven of her boys uh, to be, uh, merit to be the, Ko- the Kohen Gadol, to reach this high holy level. So they went and they asked her, what is it that you do? What is it that you have done in your life that's so special that you merited to have this special zuchut? So she said, you know, there's a, there is something that I can say that I've done very, uh, very particularly. And the Mishnah Shem, by the way, is going to give us a long list of examples like this, but I'm just coming from uh, an, an example that I'm thinking of. She said, Meolam. Never have the walls of my house been exposed to the braids of my hair. And because of that, because of that extra level of tzniyut, that even though the halakha says that you're not supposed to go out into the marketplace with your hair uncovered, at home really there is no problem to have your hair uncovered. Okay, very good. So Hashem says, okay, cover your hair when you're out in the marketplace. So she understands there's a certain level of modesty that is needed. But she decided to take it to the next level on her own. Nobody told her to do this. She decided that if Hashem wants modesty, then I can be, I can elevate my level of modesty even at home as well. And I don't have to be revealed in this way or that way, even at home. Again, it's not required halakhically. It's not something which Hashem demands of a person. But she decided that she wants to take upon herself an extra level. She wants to do something to please Hashem. Because as a person who loves Hashem, all she wants to do, and just like we know in our own relationships, when you love somebody, all you want to do is make sure that they're happy. Make sure that they have what they need. Make sure that they have what's called nachat ruach, that they are at ease, that, they are, that you do something that gives them that really good feeling inside of, wow. This person loves me. They took care of not only what I asked for, but even much more than what I asked for because they love me. There's no better feeling than that. So she was doing that. She gave Hashem that very special feeling of she loves Hashem. She wants to do the will of Hashem even more than what he asked because of her love for Hashem. That is what we call chasidut. That's the extra level that Hashem did not ask for. Now, what we're going to learn Meaning Hashem did not specifically ask for it, but there's no question that Hashem loves it, likes it, is happy with it, and it does what we call nachat ruach, gives Hashem nachat ruach to, gives him a good feeling. And that in return was her reward, that she had all seven of her children merit to be kohanim gedolim. I mean, it's, you don't find that. But that's why it says in the Gemara, Masechet Brachot, says the Mitzvah Desharim, Ashrei Adam she'amalo batorah. There's, there's a, say, a statement in the Gemara and Masechet Brachot talking about a man who studies Torah. And it says, fortunate is the man that not only studies the Torah, but he toils in the study of the Torah. What's the difference between studying Torah and toiling in the study of Torah? Toiling means that you're delving into it in order to truly understand what does Hashem want. When I was learning in Kolel, there were certain Tamidah Chachamim that were so deep in their learning that even if you thought that you had a very clear understanding of what was being taught, of what was being said, you sat there and you learned sincerely, not that you were messing around. You were really trying to learn and understand. And you really think that you have a good picture of it. But then there's a, a very big rabbi that comes over to you and asks you a question and, he, and you didn't think about that question. What about this um, Gemara over there that said this? 
Did you think about that? How does what you said work out with that? Could it be that you've misunderstood this whole Gemara completely? And time and time again, you'll notice that even though you did sit and you did study, but you didn't hit the you didn't hit the right note. You didn't get it exactly right. You missed the point. You missed the detail. Why? Why did I miss that detail and he didn't miss that detail? The answer is because when somebody truly, truly, truly wants to know and he tries so hard and he makes that effort, he pushes himself to work harder and to dig deeper and to not be satisfied with that level, but rather to go even further, all of a sudden he shows you, you know, you think you understood it, but you didn't really catch it. It's that extra level of work. That's what it says. He's not just trying to learn, but he's trying to toil deep so that he truly understands the will of Hashem. Why is it so important? Because by doing this, you're showing that all you really care about is to know what Hashem wants from us. Not just what Hashem wants, but what Hashem desires from us. Like I said before, it's possible Hashem, a possible a person could say that he wants something, but you know, you could tell from the request that he's looking for even more than that. He's looking for even a greater level than that. He wants more. Why? Because you, you understand, you see what he's looking for. You sense it, you feel it. So that's the that's the idea of Ashradam. And the end of that statement is when you're Amel Batora, when you when you go deep and you try as hard as you possibly can to understand, and you're not satisfied with just one time around, you go again and again and again. That's when you do, that's when you create Nachat Ruach for Hashem. You give him that good feeling. I'll never forget, there's a story with my Rebbe, Alama Shlom Rabbi Belsky. He was once uh, in, in, uh, in, a, in a car with somebody getting a ride somewhere with another rabbi. And there was a particular question that had come out, uh, and Rabbi Belsky issued a psak on that, whatever the question was, and so did this other rabbi. And the other rabbi had commented to Rabbi Belsky, I'm so happy that this question came up, because that gave me a reason to go study this topic, and that's how I was able to give my, my psak, my understanding of this topic because I went through it because of the question that came up. So Rebelski commented to somebody after, he said, I can't believe that he was willing to issue a, a ruling based on only one time of studying it. Can you believe? He was, he was shocked. Rebelski had finished the Shas so many times, dozens and dozens of times. And he had gone through Shulchan Aruch dozens and dozens of times. And it wasn't the first time that he had thought about this question. When it came out, he gave up because he was very, very, very familiar. He'd gone through the sugya, through the topic of this discussion many times over. And therefore, his, his psaq was very clear why he felt what he felt. And he had, there are no two ways about it. So the idea is that that's called toiling in Torah for the purposes of truly understanding what it is that Hashem wants. That's our job. Our job is to do not just what Hashem is asking us to do, but to try and reach a level where we are aiming to do even more than what Hashem wants us to do, because we're because even though officially all He asks for is ABC, but we can tell, we can sense that there's more than that, that, there, that Hashem wants more. And that's ultimately why we're here, to give Nacha to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So the Mesilat Yisharim, Gives, he, I'll just I'll read it to you inside so you see exactly what I'm saying. He says, If a person's father reveals his will, a slight, a slight revelation, meaning he reveals very little, but he explains, he expresses very slightly, He desires some, something. The son will do whatever he can. He'll increase his efforts to do whatever he can to get that for his father. Even though the father only mentioned it once and in passing, like he wasn't even focusing on it so much. You know, he said, he happened to mention that he desired a trip to uh, who knows where? Uh, to, he wanted to go see, uh, you know, the um, 
the Rocky Mountains, whatever it may be. So a, a son who sincerely loves his father will, and who has the means, who has the ability to help, he will do whatever he can to give his father what he's asking for, even though the father may not even have asked for it. He may have just said in passing, it would be great to see the Rocky Mountains. The, the son will make an effort. It's enough. The fact that his father said, I wish I could see the Rocky Mountains. He will make an effort to do from even that which he did not say explicitly. Why? Because I can figure from what my father said that, that that's something that will give him nachat, it will give him pleasure, give him a good feeling. So therefore, I'm going to make an effort. I'm not going to wait for him to tell me, son, maybe you can buy me tickets to Colorado so I can see the Rocky Mountains. No, I'm going to, I'm going to feel it in, on my own that that's what he wants. He says, if that's the case, do you think, if that's what chasidut means, do you think that all the, this fasting, rolling around in the snow, uh, you know, praying, you know, for without sleeping the whole night, uh, is that a way that you show love to Hashem, right? He says, is that a way that you, that by, by, by personally suffering, is that a method for you to show love to HaKadosh Baruch Hu? That's not, that's not the point. The point is that you should try and figure out what does Hashem want? And then you try to do as much as you can of that. For example, I'm just going to throw an example at you. It says, it says in this week's parasha, the Ikhuli Truma, famous, famous idea that when a person gives a, a donation, definitely whether, whether it's to the Bet Mikdash or whether it's to any kind of uh, organization that does wonderful things, you're taking for yourself. The Ikhuli Truma, you're taking for yourself, you're doing good for yourself. Good, fantastic. The idea though, clearly, many times Hashem has expressed in the Torah, whether it's in Last week's parasha or parashat ki tetzeh, all over the place. Patoach tiftach yedelcha, open up your hand, naton titenlo, give him, right? Vechezaktavo, you shall uphold your fellow Jew who's suffering. Now there's no question, no question about it, that you can fulfill the mitzvah of tzedakah by giving a certain amount of money a year that you give to whatever organization. You can uh, give any poor person who comes to you, you give him a dollar, give him five dollars, whatever it is, and you have fulfilled the mitzvah of tzedakah 100%. Hashem says, give him, open up your hand, help him, do what you can, fine, excellent. You fulfilled the mitzvah. But what do you, what do you understand from all of the times in the Torah that Hashem again and again says that you have to look out for the widow and you have to look out for the orphan and you have to find the, you have to see the, the poor people, you have to help them. You have to strengthen them. You have to give them anything you can. So many times the Torah mentions the idea of donations, whether it's to the Bet Mikdash or whether it's to any kind of charitable cause. It comes up again and again and again. What do you see? What do you see from all this? Yes, you can fulfill the mitzvah of tzedakah by giving your $180 to whatever organization, to Hatzalah, and whenever a poor person comes over to you, you give him X, Y, Z, $5 here, $5 here, et cetera. You did it 100%. But then there's another level. Then there's trying even harder. Then there's searching for people to give them tzedakah, trying to figure out where are they? How can I help? How can I do? That's a different level of already existence. It's trying to give. It's not just when, I, when they approach me, I search for them. That's already a different level. That's already a higher, that why, do you, why would one do that? What would prompt a person to do that? Some people might do it because it makes them feel good. Okay, that's also great. But at the same time, the ultimate reason should be because you know that when you search after a poor person and you try to help him and you try to strengthen him and you try to make him feel good and you pick him up from his, from his bad uh, state of mind and you lift him up and you elevate him, you make him feel good, you know that this is what makes Hashem happy. That's a different level of tzedakah. And that's why it says it. There's so many ways to give tzedakah. There are many different levels in tzedakah. 
There's one level where the person knows who he's giving and the guy knows who's giving it to him. There's another person, there's another guy that doesn't know who he's giving it to, but the person knows who's giving it to him. There's another level where you don't even know who you're giving it to and he doesn't know who's, get, who's giving it to him. There's another level where you're not even giving him a gift, but you're giving him a loan and you're helping him to start up on his own two feet and you're helping him to become independent or you're giving him some kind of gift capital where he can now take it and start his own business. There are different levels of tzedakah. Why are there different levels? It depends on, of course, what your means are. But more importantly, it depends on how much you're trying to do what Hashem wants you to do. How much you're trying to do the will of Hashem that you're trying to make Hashem happy. You're trying to, to give Hashem nachat. That is the, is the ultimate purpose over here. Trying to give Hashem that good feeling. He says, if that's your attitude, then it's, you'll never say, I did my mitzvah of tzedakah. Hatzalah sent me a letter in the mail. I sent them back $180. I did the mitzvah of tzedakah. Good. That's enough. I will exempt myself by doing what I'm supposed to do. I'll call upon him whatever I have to do. And that's going to be enough. He says, no. Adraba. It's the opposite. When when you love someone, you make the effort to do more than what they ask you to do because of your love for that person. And that's really what we should be aiming for. It's important to, to aim for that. You can, like I said before, you could buy two types of mezuzot. You have the $50 mezuzah and you have the $100 mezuzah, right? What's the difference? So the $50 mezuzah doesn't have the crowns and it wasn't the nicest, nicest handwriting. And the parchment maybe wasn't written uh, for the sake of mezuzah. And all kinds of things that may have been, uh, you know, not, the, again, kosher, 100% kosher. Did you do the mitzvah? Yes, I did the mitzvah. But if you know that Hashem wants better, Hashem, you, would, you would be making Hashem so much happier. If you got the better mezuzah, why? Because you know that really there's such a thing called crowns on the letter. And there's such a thing as parchment that was written for the sake of the mitzvah. And there's beautiful handwriting and there's not such nice handwriting. And there, there are things that are kosher only, you know, if there's no other choice, there are things that are kosher in the best possible way. And, you know, again, we don't have to all be connoisseurs. We don't have to all be expert uh, scribes over here. But the, I'm just giving it as an example that you can choose to go above and beyond the letter of love because if you know that this is what makes Hashem happy, then that's where you want to go. You want to do that because you love Hashem. That's the key. That's the key. So therefore, that's what the Mishnah Hashem is talking about. So he now begins chapter 19 with his own example. He wants to give his own example for this type of a thing. And it's a very clear, wonderful example. The first example that he gives is what it says about the mitzvah of lulav and etrog. We know that we have a mitzvah on Sukkot to take lulav and etrog, the four species, and the mitzvah technically can be accomplished by simply, even if they're not even all combined in one, in one unit, you could take on the first day of Sukkot a lulav, pick it up. You could take hadasim, pick them up. You could take aravot, pick them up. And you can take an etrog and pick it up too, individually, one by one, and you fulfilled the mitzvah. I didn't lift it, I didn't lower it, wave it back, forward, this way, that way, didn't do none of that. I simply picked up four different species. Lulav, boom, put it down. Etrog, up, down. I took the hadasim, down, aravot, down, no problem. I did the mitzvah, 100%. And we're all stuck there in shul going this way, that way, that way, behind us, in front of us, all around, up, down. What's going on? Says the Gemara, this already is the Talmud talking. Says the Gemara in Masechet Sukkot. Shiare mitzvah me'akvim et apuranut. Here we see a very beautiful example of what we just said. The mitzvah has been accomplished even without holding them all at the same time. You don't even need to hold them all at the same time. One by one is good enough. Yet it says clearly in the Gemara already that the best possible way to hold, to do this mitzvah is to bring them all together and then to wave them in the different directions and to, towards different directions of the, of the world, 
north, south, east, west, however which way you do it based on the area or based on whichever minag that you have, to wave them upwards and downwards. And that says the Gemara has the power to stop evil, bad forces, bad winds from coming and destroying the produce and destroying all kinds of things that could potentially harm the, the, the year's produce. Now, that that you just waved the lulav and the etrog is not part and parcel of the mitzvah. You could have fulfilled the mitzvah by simply fulfilling the words of the pasuk, which says, take for yourselves on the first day of Sukkot, four species. Take for yourselves the lulav, the etrog, the hadasim, the aravot, pick them up, each one, one by one, put it down. You did the mitzvah. You fulfilled the mitzvah. But nevertheless, we see that the mere taking of them together and waving them is able to stop so much damage and harm from all of us by being able to prevent the evil, bad winds, bad forces from destroying our produce. So therefore, it concludes the Gemara in Masechet Sukkah, She'are Mitzvah, those extra parts of the Mitzvah, those parts that don't make or break the Mitzvah, you still did it. You still did the mitzvah, even if you did not wave the lulav netrog, but nevertheless, anut, you are still able to hold off, to prevent the, the devastation, the calamity from befalling Am Yisrael by doing that. Why? What's the reason behind it? Again, it's the same concept. Says the Mesilat Sharim, the reason is because when you're doing, when you're holding these four species, you are giving nacha to Hashem. You're waving them this way, that way, back. You're, you're, you're uniting with them. You're, 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 you're trying to get the message behind them. You're trying to internalize the message behind them. And then you're praying to Hashem with them to protect you based on the merit of this mitzvah. There's no greater nachat to Hashem. That's why it has such incredible power. Because of your true deep desire to serve Hashem out of love. That's the idea. That's why it has so much power. So that's a very important thing to understand. And it goes for every mitzvah that we do. Every mitzvah. Whatever we can. Try and understand it. Try and get the message behind it. Try and do it in a way where you really understand on the deepest level, uh, as much as you can, to do everything properly. And more than that, to try and and connect with the mitzvah, to, to understand what it is that Hashem really wants. That's why I mentioned before, I think it's important to mention again, a lot of times people are, they like to do borderline Judaism. They like to say, well, the halacha says that it's okay. Okay, good. The halacha says that it's okay. Even if that were true, and many times it's not. But let's say that it is. You're missing the point. You're missing the point of, of, of the whole thing. Like I think I might have given this example in the past. Forgive me if I have, but I want to just share with you again. Like the example of a woman singing through a microphone in front of men. Like, even if let's say that that's something which the halacha will allow, which I'm not saying that it's true at all. I'm not saying that it does. I'm just saying that I've heard some people say something like that. So even if let's say they would be right, because what they're claiming is that really you're not listening to the woman's voice. You're just uh, hearing the the echo and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's electronic and it's not really... You know, if you're standing far away, you can't hear her actual voice. You're hearing the microphone. So you're not violating the rule of the rabbis that says, Kol be'isha erva, that the voice of a woman is considered to be an erva, like nakedness. So, okay, even if let's say you can pull that off somehow halachically, I'm not saying that they can, but I'm saying let's say that they, for argument's sake, that they are, that they're right. But you have to consider, what does Hashem really want? And you got to think for, for yourself something. What does Hashem really want? We have so many teachings from the rabbis about how it's so important for, for its newt, for a woman, that, that she should be modest and she shouldn't, you know, uh, go ahead and, and make, a, uh, make herself very um, uh, revealed publicly, you know, in, in terms of uh, not just physically revealed, but to just be out there in front of everybody and uh, and and sing because of this statement of Kol Be'isha There's so many different teachings throughout the rabbis 
כל כבודה בת מלך פנימה לתהילים says the, the honor of the, of, the, of the daughter of the king is, you know, inwards. There's so many teachings from the rabbis where we have an idea, we have an understanding. If you just look a little deeper than the superficial surface, you'll see what Hashem really wants. And if you love Hashem, you're not satisfied with just, just doing okay, just being mediocre, just saying, okay, if the halacha allows it, then I do it, right? It's a little bit more than that. It's trying to understand deep down inside from someone who loves, but just like you love that other person. I want to understand truly, what do you want, Hashem? What do you want? I want to know because that's what I want. I want to do what makes you happy. And you have to ask yourself, is this girl singing in front of men, is that making Hashem happy or not? That's really what it boils down to. And if the answer is no, then don't do it. That's it. Even if you can pull it off somehow halachically, it's important to think in terms of what makes Hashem happy. That's really what we're learning over here. It's a challenge. A lot of times people don't think in these terms. They say, if the halacha says it's okay, then that's what we should do. And it's, although it's true that there's no question our guiding force in life is what does the Torah say that we're allowed to do and what does the Torah say we're not allowed to do. But there's no question that there's a level beyond that. And that's what the Mesilat Yishayim is talking about tonight. It's talking about really sincerely trying to figure out what does Hashem want. And, how, and, and, it, and you shouldn't even be bothered by it. You should love that this is what you're doing. That's, that's what we should be on a level that it doesn't upset us. It, it makes us happy to do that. There are many, many more examples that I can give about this, but um, I think we should continue. If anybody has, if anybody would like more examples, we could talk about it after the class. Mention. Okay, so let's continue. So now we're starting chapter 19. So he goes on to say another important point that this comes up in, and this, this is not in between mitzvot, between man and Hashem. But now it's a question of pleasing Hashem between man and his fellow. Beguf says the Mishnah Sharim. He says, "Metiv labriot velo mera lahem." Right? You 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 do good to people. You don't do evil to them in your body, which means la azor kol adam b'mashiuchal to try and help any person, however you can. Ve'yakel masaam me'alehem. And to lessen the burden that's on them. And this is what the rabbis call in Pirkei Avot, Nose Be'olim Chavero, which means the person bears the burden together with his fellow. And if a person has the opportunity to help somebody and to, to, to bear their burden, Yitrach Kedei La'asoto, he will get himself involved in order to help out. This is something, Rabotai, that many people shy away from. It's not the easiest thing to get involved, to get entangled in people's business. It's not easy at all. But sometimes when you do that, there's nothing more rewarding. When you know that there's something you could do, you know that somebody's having a hard time struggling, whatever it may be. And you say to yourself, well, okay, you know, they're going through a hard time, but Hashem will help them and that's it. Everything should be okay and that's it. So, you know, you're, you're taking the easy way out. You're, you're deciding that you don't want to get involved. But sometimes that person needs a person to talk to. That person needs maybe a little financial help. That person needs uh, a good idea, a good something that you'll be there for them. That's called being to bear the burden of your friend. And it feels great on the receiving end. When you know that somebody is there for you, to help you, to help you get through a difficult time, that is a level of chasidut that's exactly what Hashem wants. That He sees that we're there for each other. Very important. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu is saying, yes, you could do the mitzvah of chesed once a year. You know, you, uh, you, you, I don't know, you go to Tomchei Shabbat, you pack Shabbat you know, packages, and you did it, you did your mitzvah chesed for the year, you're good, 100%. You did the mitzvah. But at the same time, there are many, many, many opportunities that a person has around his even immediate family, where a person finds themselves 
finds themselves in, in need, they find themselves in situations that are difficult, and you can be there for that person. And they shouldn't even need to say anything. They shouldn't even need to mention it. But you show up to the door with a nice anything, nice, uh, you know, uh, food for Shabbat, flowers. You show up, you give them a smile. Can I spend some time with you? Can I talk with you? Can I, whatever it may be, you share, you, you, you shoulder the burden together with them. Says the Mislat Shalim, that is what we're talking about. He says, Bemamon, when it comes to a person's money, a person should do anything they can to help prevent damages from his fellow. And that's what it says in Pirkei Avot, The money of your fellow should be as precious to you as your own money. A person that has the opportunity to prevent any kind of harm from his fellow when it comes to their money, again, it, you don't necessarily have to do all of these things as uh, from the strict letter of love. But again, if you love someone, if you care about someone, and you know that this is something that they would want, that they would need, then you have to help them out. You have to help them. That's the idea. Again, it's not necessarily required from the strict letter of the halacha. There's no case that says specifically that if A, B, and C is the situation, you have to do X, Y, and Z. It might not say that straight out, but you have to again ask, what does Hashem want of me? What makes Hashem happy? And the Torah has expressed many times the idea that we should be there for our fellow whether it's with our own bodies or whether it's financially with our money to, or to help them not to lose their money, very important. And lastly, Benefesh says the Mesilat Yisharim, Try and give your fellow a good, positive feeling, whether it's with kavod, whether it's in any other you know, way. I mean, one of the beautiful things that I've seen in the Persian community is the idea that there's a very uh, strict uh, understanding of titles that should be used. In other words, when you speak to somebody, you should address them by uh, some kind of a nice title, respectful title, uh, you know, Mr. So-and-so, even though, you know, it's not necessarily true. I mean, people that have a 20 or 30 age year gap, as long as they're adults, many times they call each other by the first name. But, but in this community, you'll see that a lot of times people will address the other person, even though they're both adults, by Mr. or so-and-so. There are different titles that they give as a, as a way to respect one another. That's a beautiful thing. The reason is because when the person on the receiving end, is he feels that you are giving him respect, that feels great. That's a wonderful feeling. That's, that gives the person nachat. So that's what he's saying. Kol mashu yodeha. Whatever you know, that if you do that to your fellow, who that person will feel good because of what you just did. That is a level of piety to do that. Again, because it never says anywhere in halacha that when you address that guy, you should call him Mr. So-and-so. It doesn't say it anywhere. You won't find it in any book. But what you can understand is that you will be giving him a good, positive feeling, and therefore it's worth it. That's not required by halacha, but it's a very good thing, and you understand that since Hashem wants that, that we give each other a good feeling, then that's what we should be doing. Again, not because it makes me feel good, but really because that's what Hashem ultimately wants. Because she can, says the Mesilat Yisharim, shelo yitzarenu bishum yinitzar klal, definitely we shouldn't ever be involved in giving anybody any suffering. Right? That's, that's a very important thing to understand. Involved in this is Renifata Shalom Shua Tava Klalit Ben Kol Adam Involved in this is running after peace, chasing after peace. Many times people get into fights. They do things and they get upset at each other and then they leave it off with the, the famous whatever. And that whatever, when they decide because of that whatever, not to talk to each other for 20 years, and then whatever, they've gone through a lifetime of not speaking because nobody decided to step in and maybe uh, try and bring some peace between the siblings or between the, uh, the partners or whatever it is that may have gone wrong. And had somebody maybe given a little bit of extra thought to, you know, Hashem loves 
when there's peace in Klal Yisrael. Shem loves when there's unity in Am Yisrael. If somebody would have maybe pushed a little bit harder, we might have been able to have, uh, uh, you know, protected uh, the, the, sh- the shalom in Am Yisrael. It's so important. There's a story with um, two men in the Syrian community that they're actually two brothers. And uh, these two brothers were, uh, they were, I believe they were business partners. And at a certain point, they had some kind of fallout from each other. And they weren't talking to each other. And they actually prayed in the same synagogue. And they would go to the same synagogue, but they're not talking to each other. And they're brothers, they're family. And, you know, the families got torn apart. And it was just a really devastating thing. And this was going on for a very long time. And it got ugly. And then people were bad-mouthing each other. Just a really bad story. And they're going on, they're going on for a long time. And eventually, somebody down the road, maybe it was 10 years later, said, you know what? This is insane. I've got here two brothers. They're praying in the same synagogue. They see each other all the time. They don't talk to each other. They don't say anything to each other. And he decided to go over to one brother. And he decided to be like Aaron Cohen. And he decided that he's going to tell the brother, listen, you know, I spoke to your other brother. And he is just, he can't, he can't believe that he's living his life without you. And you're so special to him. You're so important to him. And he, he, all he wants to do is come over to you and say, I'm sorry. And just, you know, move on with life and get back together. You're his brother. Maybe you'd be interested. And he said, really? He's interested in that? And he said, yes. Meanwhile, he never said one word to the brother. But he figured that this would arouse some kind of good feeling from this brother. So the brother said, yes, I am interested in that. He says, you know what? I'm going to go speak to him. And I'm going to tell him that. So he goes and speaks to another brother and he says, listen, I want you to know I spoke to your brother and he's interested in speaking with you. He says, says, you don't understand. He is, he's so tired of not speaking with you. You mean so much to him. You're his brother. And whatever happened doesn't matter. None of it matters. What matters is that you get back together and that your family all over again. And surely enough, they both had this feeling inside and they were waiting for somebody to go ahead and to do this. And this person managed to get these two brothers and these two families to start talking again, to be, you know, happy with each other and to reunite, basically. Now, there was one rabbi who heard about this story. And this rabbi was very upset. And they asked him, why are you so upset? It's a great story. It's beautiful. They're getting back together. What's wrong? He said, why did it take the guy 10 years to think of this genius idea? For 10 years, they lost their smachot with each other. They lost their relationship with each other. 10 years, they didn't have each other. Okay, yes, of course, they eventually got back together, which is wonderful, at least that. But why so long? Why such a long and difficult time without that? So the idea is sometimes we have to kind of have our antennas up. And if we sense something like that coming, we should try and do something. We should try and make the make this kind of thing not happen. It's not right that families should not talk to each other. It's not right that partners for 50 years should not talk to each other. That people have been, you know, have had relationship and all of a sudden because of something, that's it. There's no more, you know, there's nothing left to do because what? What happened? What's so bad that I can't invite you? have been partners for 30 years. I can't invite you to my son's wedding. Why? What happened? What's so bad? Why can't we try and resolve it? So the idea is because sometimes people just don't care. So our job is to say, well, what does Hashem want? That we just go about our lives and not care and not look at anybody else and, and just forget about it all. As long as I'm okay, then that's what counts. Or maybe no, to say, I'm not that I'm nosy, God forbid, and I care to know what's going on in your business. But if I know that there's an issue and I think that I can help, so I help. I try. I try to make it happen. Right? Again, that's I'm talking to myself as well. If we think that there's something that we can do, there's some way that we can improve the situation, it's a chesed, it's an act of kindness to go ahead and to do that. It's very important. Now, we don't have that much time left, but I would like to start with you the next section, which I think is very important. What we're going to see now is a very interesting proof to all of this that, we, um, that we've been saying. Again, the concept here is the attribute of being pious. What it means is that you're doing something beyond the letter of the law. You're not required 
legally to get in between those two brothers and make peace. There's no halacha that requires you to do this. Correct. It's true. There's no halacha that, that requires you to seek out people in need of tzedakah and to give it to them. Correct. You're not required to. But again, we're trying to figure out what makes Hashem happy. And when you do that, then that's what we're trying to figure out. How can we do that to go ahead and to make Hashem happy? So now the idea over here is that those extra things really mean a whole lot to Hashem. When you go beyond the letter of the law, it means a whole lot. The proof to this, says the Mesilat Hashem, is a very interesting Gemara in Masechet Megillah on Dav Chafzayin Amud Aleph, where over there, the Gemara goes and talks to the greatest sages of the Talmud, the most incredible rabbis that, that lived. And the Gemara asks them all, what did you do to live so long? Yamim. What did you do to live this long? Why did Hashem grant you such long life? The Gemara asks this question to many different rabbis. And the answers that they gave are very striking. All of these rabbis, and I want you to know a very important thing about our Talmud. It says in the, ta- it says in the, in the writings of the Vilna Gaon, any rabbi mentioned in the Gemara had the power to revive the dead. We're talking about the holiest of holy people. You're talking about people who reviewed their learning thousands, if not tens of thousands of times. Talking about people on levels that we can't even imagine who we're speaking about. And then the Gemara asks them, what is it that you did in order to reach a long life? And that's not their answer. Their answer is not, well, I was a superstar learner. I never stopped learning Torah for, at any point in my life. I always was, uh, was praying or learning or doing mitzvot. That's not the answer that they give. They all each give their own unique individual answer. Now, most likely... The reason for that is, and I heard this uh, point from Rabbi Moshe Mir Weiss, which is a very important point. He says that most likely the reason is because most people can't copy that. In other words, most people can't lead lives that are uh, all, you know, learning and Torah and, and mitzvot. And, but what they're, they are pointing out is that, but you could do this, which is on your level beyond the letter of the law. I can show you something that I've done, which is not required by halacha, but you can do it too. And that's going to be a blessing for you too. And that is where we're headed right now. Just before we, before we go there, I want to share with you on a contemporary level, something that, again, I heard from Rabbi Moshe Meir Weiss, a beautiful idea. He points this out from contemporary rabbis that were asked the same question. Rav Moshe Feinstein was asked this question, how did you live so long? And his answer was, I never caused another person pain. Amazing. So again, you have here the Gdola Dor, who's finished the Shas hundreds of times, finished the Shulchan Ruch hundreds of times, spent hours writing Teshuvot to people, spent so many countless hours helping Am Yisrael. He's done so much. And his answer was, never caused pain to people. That's something that we can work on. He gave us a tool to work on. Try not to cause pain to people. I'll give you another example. He said, Rav Shach, Rav Shach, Zecher Tzadik Levracha, the, the, the Rav Shiva of Panovich who really spanned just worlds of generations from pre-war Europe with the Chafetz Chaim as an adult, all the way to the 1990s and passed away in the early 2000s, saw just the world turn around completely, leading Am Yisrael in Eretz Yisrael, and they asked him, how did you live so long? How did you live to this point? He lived well over 100 years, and he was still giving shurim. He was still, I remember hearing about him that he would uh, walk, up, walk up the stairs, and it was like so, so hard for him to walk up the stairs because he was over 100 years old. But then when he would say the shur, it was like he was 30 all over again. He was saying it, firing away, and it was no issue. Amazing miracles with this great rabbi. So you know what his answer was, why I lived so long? He said, because I always said Birkat Amazon from a bencher, from a birkon. I never said it by heart. I always read it from inside. Again, there's no halakha in 
the Shulchan Aruch that says when you say Birkat Amazon, you have to read it from the Sidur or from a bencher or from, never says that. You could say it by heart and you did the mitzvah 100%. But if this is going to help you to concentrate better, because your head's not wandering around all over the place, you're focused on the words that are in the book in front of you. If you know that this is going to make Hashem happy, and you know this is why we're here, to try and give Hashem nacha, to try and make Hashem happy, so then this is something that we can do. We can do that. Again, Rav Shach is saying that, he's not saying that I wrote, uh, you know, many, many books on the Rambam, and that I was a Rosh Hashiva for decades. He's not saying that. He's saying, I never benched without a Bencher. Amazing. One more. Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky, Zecher Tzadik Livarcha. He said, I never told a lie and I always was careful not to hurt someone's feelings. Again, this is a Torah giant. Rosh Hashiva of Torah Vadas. The, the, the whole generation stood on this man's shoulders. Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky, huge. And that's what he had to say. He said that I never told a lie and I never hurt someone's feelings. Amazing. Again, that's a big thing to say. That's also, a bit, but we can we can aim for that. We can try and accomplish that. We can try and achieve that. And again, that's something that it doesn't say. I mean, it does say we're not allowed to lie. It does say that we're not supposed to hurt people's feelings. But the level that we're careful about it. I'll give you an example about Rav Yaakov himself. Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky once went to somebody's home. He was a young man, and he was, it was Pesach. And at the time in Europe. He was uh, a young man that, that was being hosted. The yeshivas in Europe didn't have dormitories. They would be hosted by a family. And it was Passover. And on Passover, there are many, many stringencies that people have. And he was invited to a person's house. And he looked at the kitchen. He did not like what he saw whatsoever. And he was not eating there under any circumstances whatsoever. He just wasn't going to eat there. So he, he realized that, you know, they're going to be very offended, very embarrassed if he doesn't eat there. So he said, oh, wow, there's a mistake here. They put me by the wrong house. He said, they, they said, what do you mean? They told us you're here. He said, yeah, no, but I realize you guys eat gibroks. Gibroks is when you wet the matzah and you put things on the matzah. By the Hasidim, they don't eat what they call gibroks. They don't have anything wet on top of the matzah. They don't have matzah balls. They don't have salads on the matzah or anything like that. So he says, my, my minhag is not to eat gibroks. So now his minhag was absolutely to eat gibroks. He ate every type of matzah that was wet, no problem. But because he wasn't happy with the kashrut of the kitchen, he said, I don't eat gibroks. Now, since that moment, the moment that he said those words, from that day and on, he never ate gibroks on Pesach. Why? Because he said, I don't tell lies. So I said, I don't eat gibroks. I don't eat gibroks. I don't eat that, the, the matzah. That's, that's what he did it to get out of embarrassing these people. But I mean, look at the extent that somebody is willing to go. He changed his entire minad just, first of all, not to tell a lie. Uh, and also not to hurt these people. Again, this is, he was not required to do that. He could technically have said, listen, I'm sorry, but uh, not for me. And they would understand it. They'd get hurt but he had a kosher Passover, right? There are ways of doing things, and he excelled in this area. Now, we're going to see exactly, Blinader, what the Gemara is going to say about all these different rabbis, Blinader, next time, because I realize that we have uh, run out of time, unfortunately. So, Zashem Blinader, uh, we will continue next time. Next Monday night, we uh, will not be having class. I will not be here, but Bezad Hashem Blinader, the following uh, week, Blinader, we will continue. Chazakim, Ruchim, everybody, thank you very much for joining us. And if we have any uh, questions, we can go ahead and we can talk now if you'd like.